Hello, welcome back to another Portworks Lightboard session. My name is Ryan Walner, and today we're gonna go over how to configure your Portworks storage cluster. So this is gonna take sort of a higher level uh, view of a Kubernetes and Portworks system, as well as what things you should think about in terms of configuring your Portworks cluster on Kubernetes and which commands and flags you actually want to give Portworks in order to install it correctly. So here we have a setup with a group of Kubernetes masters for high availability. This is recommended and a set of worker nodes, which we're going to go ahead and visualize installing Portworks on. So Portworks itself needs a number of different resources, right? So each one of these worker nodes needs a number of, you know, CPU associated with it. Whether you're in cloud or on-prem using bare metal, you want at least four cores. And uh, recommended probably more than that, depending on what type of workloads you're running on each individual worker. Say if you're running a lot of databases, four cores is probably not enough, but the minimum we need for Portworks with some applications on it is four cores. The other uh, bit of this is we recommend at least four gigabytes of memory. Now, again, same goes with cores here. The more is probably the more powerful, but depending on your cost, to workload ratio and what type of workload you're using, how memory intensive it is, you know, uh, you can configure these resource constraints within Kubernetes to kind of maintain the level of utilization across the system that uh, Kubernetes really enables you to do. But for Portworks to run, at least have these two minimums. The other thing is for Portworks, we're a persistent storage system and data management system, so we need some sort of backing disk or backing drive. Now these drives should be at least eight gig, but we recommend uh, 128 gig. Now, eight gig's pretty small because say if we have four nodes, right, you're not looking at a total amount of storage that's gonna uh, allow you to have a lot of gains here. But with 128, on each node, you're looking at a significant storage pool that can support many storage systems. Now, it's not uncommon to see each one of these storage nodes to have upwards of a terabyte on each node, right? So depending on your workload and what you're gonna be running on it, this is what to consider. Network, again, we recommend a 10 gig link between them. Now there is a management and um, data network, right? So you can separate your control plane traffic from your data, aka replication and storage IO from applications onto separate networks. And we'll talk a little bit about that, right? So a data network will exist. We're just labeling this D and a ma management network will also exist. I'm gonna label this M. So the management network can be connected on an Ethernet device and the data network can do the same. Now, this allows you to separate, like I said, IO, data traffic versus management and control plane. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how to actually configure that in a second, but make sure these, at least the data network is using that 10 gig link. Uh, management's probably fine with a one. The ports needed for Portworks, um, at least we're going to need 9001 through 9021 and this range is configurable um this is the default range really unless you have overlapping uh port uh conflicts there's really no need to change that um as this is kind of a standard way that portworks communicates um if you don't have to definitely you know, no need to do that. Kernel version, you want at least uh, 3.10 for your Linux uh, operating system distribution, um, just because we use a lot of the modern um, uh, Linux kernel integration and um, workflows and data flows. Key value store database, right? This is either um, etcd is definitely the most common um, or console from HashiCorp, also an option there. And yes, your Kubernetes cluster 
uh, probably runs etcd on the masters but keep in mind this key value database is completely separate right so um i'll label this here on this diagram etcd and this is going to be attached to our port works over the network and it is completely separate. We keep um, some cluster information, metadata, and those kind of things. Now, um, for clusters that are decent size, like 20, 25 nodes of portworks, we recommend the external database, uh, key value store database, uh, because it's going to leave that uh, IO and um, uh, CPU kind of capacity on an external system as well as keep it on a separate failure domain, right? So this is a good idea to have on a separate failure domain as well as kind of make sure to configure it with compaction and backups and snapshots so that you can recover that etcd database. Same things you do for um, your Kubernetes etcd database as well. So. We'll talk about both options. There is an option to have a built-in key value store, which basically means Portwork spins one up and maintains the whole thing for you. You never have to think about a thing. Uh, it even takes snapshots. Um, there are operations to back up and restore uh, from that internal one. Again, that's under 20, 20 to 25 Portworks nodes. So now we have kind of a good picture of the resources needed for Portworks. We're going to talk about how to actually configure it. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is our dash C option. Now, um, after I go through some of these, I'll show kind of an example or link to an example of what this looks like within the Kubernetes deployment uh, or daemon set as Portworx runs as. And uh, so you can get a view of kind of what this looks like from the command line or YAML view. But dash C is our cluster name, right? And you can name this kind of whatever. It's best to be unique. Um, there is, uh, you know, there is the opportunity of conflict if you spin up this application um, and it configures itself in etcd, it use the same name again. You may have conflicts. So just make sure that cluster name is unique. Um, and this is an important one. It is required, right? So. The other part of this that we're going to talk about is our um, storage, our data storage coming, uh, options. So there's a few here. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to go through a few. Um, so you're going to want to configure at least one of these, right, for identifying your storage disks or your backing store, those eight or one twenty eight gigabyte uh, drives, which will exist on the infrastructure or they'll be provisioned through some kind of cloud drive um, or SAN attached storage. <laughs> but in either case, this dash S will be used to say, point to a specific drive, meaning dev SDB, uh, and you can have a number of, number of them listed, uh, or this can actually be used with a volume template. And I'll link to kind of the volume templates, but this is used in cloud to say, you know, I want to use GP2 with, uh, you know, 200 gigabyte volumes. And this would be considered a, a template. And Portworx will automatically go and talk to that cloud API, provision them and attach them to Portworx workers. Dash Z is a zero storage node. So use this if you want the Portworx node to contribute in the Portworx cluster, meaning it, it wants to attach and mount volumes and allow applications to have IO to and from it. Um, but it's not going to participate in giving the storage cluster any more storage, meaning it doesn't have to have a disk. So dash Z, zero storage node. And dash A is basically give me everything you find. So Portworx will go ahead and kind of interrogate the system and see what kind of um, free unmounted drives you have. Uh, you can actually add a dash F to say force use any drive that you know has um, a file system on it. But you know, these are sort of the, 
the operations and, and parameters used most typically. Uh, now we talked about those networks, data and management. Those are configured using dash D for data and dash M for management network. Um, you know, E0, E1, those kind of things. And um, there is uh, another piece that's probably important for this example, which is dash X, which is your scheduler. So you're gonna actually tell that your scheduler is Kubernetes, which tells it, please talk to my Kubernetes scheduler to do a little bit extra. Um, you know, we talked about Stork. There's a separate video on Stork, which is storage orchestrated for Kubernetes. And this integrates very tightly with the Kubernetes scheduler and this kind of what enables it. Um, the key value store, also a very important one. You know, it's going to be IP and uh, port. And again, this typically runs on like 2379, I believe. But the idea here is that this would be the IP address of your load balancer or um, virtual IP of your etcd database that Portworx can communicate with. The other part of this is that um, if you don't want to use an external database, you can patch it in dash B. Dash B says, use my internal a TD database or a key value store database. And Portworx will go ahead and automatically provision a key value, highly available key value store on at least three of the nodes and configure things like compaction backups and things like that. Again, under 25 nodes, 20 nodes, you'll want to probably take advantage of that because Whereas you'll have to maintain the, you know, the where uh, the etcd cluster is here as well as the cluster itself. This sort of just leave it to Portworx. Now there's a number of different other pieces to this puzzle where if you're using the internal one, you'll want to configure uh, a metadata flag, which says um, these are specific drives for key value store database to um, send the metadata IO so it doesn't get in the way of the data IO. Separate disks. Uh, there's other things like cache device, which is a cool one, which uh, essentially allows you to choose a fast drive on each one of these nodes. Say each one of these Portworx nodes had a GB2 volume and then on that server it had an NVMe or an IO1 type disk. Um, that is definitely gonna be faster than general purpose drives. You can use that as a cache device, which essentially allows or works to use it as cache as it um, entails. So these are some of the more important flags. Again, dash C for cluster name, dash A for everything in terms of grabbing disks, Z for zero storage node, S for the exact storage, meaning the uh, disk template or storage device itself, dash D for data network, dash M for the management network, X for scheduler, so Swarm or Kubernetes, and uh, dash K for an external key value store, dash B for the internal key value store database, cache device for configuring cache device, dash metadata for having the metadata for internal key value store. And there are more, right? Um, not a ton more, but I will link to uh, what this looks like. And don't be concerned about, you know, you know, how am I gonna keep track of all these uh, options? Um, we have something called the spec generator, uh, and you can access this at central dot portworks dot com and if you head there I'll I'll kind of show on the screen uh, what this looks like and if you go through the spec generator uh, it will automatically configure or allow you to select these options in a graphical way. Um, and as I'm talking through this, I'll probably put a video of how this looks. Um, so uh, definitely take a look at this. And this should give you an idea of kind of what you should think about when configuring your Portwork storage cluster. So until next time, I hope you enjoyed that. Take care.